vais passer la parole à un vieux complice, euh, Karl Kaiser. Je dis vieux complice, en fait, euh, en, en anglais, on dire a friend of long standing. C est, c est, ça évite de, de parler de vieux euh, complice. Mais enfin, il est quand même un, un vieux complice, un ami, puisque nous nous connaissons depuis le milieu des années 70 et que nous avons travaillé de longues années ensemble quand il était le, le patron de la euh, Deutsche Gesellschaft sur Auswärtige Politik à, à, à Bonn puis à Berlin et qui depuis un certain nombre d'années euh, vit à, à, à Bruxelles, euh, à Bruxelles, ça plus du tout, non, à, à, aux états unis et à la, la Kennedy School of Government, où il est toujours... Euh, non, à Harvard, d'ailleurs, en fait. Non, c'est la Kennedy non, School. C'est hein? la même chose. Oui, c'est la même chose. Enfin, <rire> c'est partie de Harvard. Bon. Enfin, merci de, de compenser ma confusion. Et euh, en tout cas, mon cher Karl, voilà, voilà un bon exemple de sagesse et je te passe la parole avec joie. Thank you, Thierry, for these kind words. And indeed, it has been a long and wonderful relationship that we had, and I can only congratulate you uh, on what you have created, because you remember you started out to create IFRI and then to create this conference, and both have made a major contribution. I was inspired by the conference to share some thoughts on the long term, on the geopolitical long term, the world of tomorrow, which will be one of a new G2 two big powers dominating that structure, namely the United States and China in a relationship of rivalry comparable to the bipolar world that we had during the Cold War. Three points in good French tradition. Who is actually destroying the order that was created after World War II? We discussed one. Uh, The, name, the very country that bought it, that built it up, and led the restructuring of the world after World War II, leaving the JCPOA, thereby really questioning the continuation of non-proliferation policy that was built up after the war. The same you could say about American policy on North Korea, leaving the Paris Accord, leaving the TPP, which was, which was an attempt to organize the, the Pacific Asian world so that China does not uh, define the, the rules of the game, ending TTIP in Europe, with Europe, destroying the World Trade Organization, imposing tariffs on friends and allies, withdrawing from the most successful part of American foreign policy, the support of European integration, questioning the alliances, and using the dollar, if not abusing the dollar, to impose foreign policy goals on the rest of the world. Quite, a, quite, an, quite, quite an attempt with some success. We discussed it in a very good session that we had here. However, there is somebody else. There is the great challenger, China, rising, which poses as the defender of multilateralism, of international law, of international institutions. But I would argue that's an intermediate position. If you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, and we heard it from Ken Rudd, it creates a wide system of bilateral dependencies of states that are friendly, if not compliant, and activities in Latin America and in Africa with the same purpose. And let me remind you that the country that professes that international organization and international law and multilateralism should guide the world of the future decided to totally neglect the decision of the International Court in The Hague on the militarization of the islands in the South China Sea. I thought it was very well summed up in one remark in the Hong Kong debate that Eric Lee made when he said, we have to, and it's almost verbatim, we have to replace the hegemonic universalism in defining the rules of globalization by one country, brackets, the United States. And we have to replace it by a system where everybody defines the rules of globalization by himself, brackets, with China leading. So, The old system 
is challenged profoundly. Secondly, we have now to look at how some global trends affect this emerging G2 world. And I think all, and I would like to mention three, which I think are underestimated in their impact, and all three have been discussed here, and I do hope that the World Policy Conference will continue to discuss them in the coming years. There's first cyber war. We have entered a new era. I think Jean-Louis Gervais was right to say this is, so to speak, a Clausewitzian innovation. It's the continuation of politics by other means. Cyber war, not war, not the old kind of war, cyber war. Indeed, one can now, through cyber activity, affect the politics of another country without having armies to march. You could argue, as I did in the debate, that Putin succeeded in getting his men into the White House by cyber activity at the cost of less than a fighter jet. Quite a success. That is the new era that we are entering. And uh, some of you were there when I argued with John Sawyer, who, who said this is a problem in particular for authoritarian countries because they're very shaky, because the democracies have the checks and balances system. I would argue that's true, that the, the, we have the checks and balances system. However, democracies have particular weaknesses because they're open. The social media are open. We believe in freedom of speech. So the cyber war attack can be conducted much more easily in democracies. And as you know, those who follow American politics, it is the majority leader of the Senate who blocks the legislation to protect America in the next election, 2020, against further cyber, cyber activity to affect the elections of 2020. So that's the one part. The second part, which you, you allude to, is the climate change. Have we really thought through what the climate change will do to international politics? Here is a task for the future. Imagine it goes up to 2% or to 3 as, as uh, uh, Monsieur Fabius was mentioning these alternatives. Already now, the United States has lost an entire city, an entire town in California. There will be more towns. Um, coastal cities will have to be evacuated. In other words, the reallocation of means will be fundamental. What will it mean for the need to have land as the land disappears? And finally, let me mention migration. Migration completely affected and changed domestic politics in Europe and the United States. And it will be very much a problem of Europe because America is surrounded by oceans. Uh, as Africa grows, You've heard the debate here, two and a half million by 2050, four to five billion by the end of the century. There will be an enormous pressure from the South. And unless there is a fundamental change of policy to help the people stay where they are, which means a complete change of European policy, this is going to be Europe's biggest problem in the future. Finally, third point, the US-European relationship in this kind of G2 world. Let's remember first, that US, the US and Europe are the cores of the West, of Western democracy, of human rights, they have peaceful relations. That has been their function and will remain their function. Second, they have the highest degree of economic integration of any two large areas. 50% of all transatlantic trade are internal company trade. They're highly, highly integrated. This, Europe has reacted to Trump with the strategy of sticking to the old rules, sticking to the old institutions, circumventing him wherever possible, Japan and the European Union having trade agreements or, Mer or, or a trade agreement with Mercosur. Let us remember that the US public, and you will have listened to the debate here desc describing how uh, America has changed and to what extent there's continuity in American thinking from that Trump really continues the old policies. Keep in mind that this is not the opinion of the American public. There is another America besides Trump. 87% polls of the Chicago Council believe in international trade. 70% believe in the NATO commitment. In fact, it has gone up since, since Trump was elected. 78% uh, actually. So there is that, plus the Congress, who has a very different point of view. 
So let us not assume that what Trump is now pursuing is the policy of the America that rebuilt the American-European relationship. Um, and the European Union is pulling together under this pressure. Yes, Europe is divided in many ways, but it is also becoming much more aware of the necessity to act on its own. And whether they are principal nations, a concept that we developed jointly quite a few years ago, principal nations, like yesterday, France and Germany made a statement on Turkey. There will be other principal nations in the, in the European Union, and even after Brexit, Britain will still be in the European group. So there is a talk now of majority voting in, in foreign policy. It will probably come one day. Let me conclude. In the G world, the G2 world, the US-China rivalry world, I think one can argue this. The US will continue to need Europe in this competition. The US cannot allow China to dominate the western rim of the European, of, of Eurasia. That is a given. And Europe needs the United States in order to survive in this kind of rivalry. And finally, Europe will, for the same reason, not, uh, will not fail to engage Russia anew because in this world of the future, a Russia that becomes a permanent satellite of China is uh, not acceptable neither to Europe nor to the United States. Thank you very much, Karl. Uh, Karl uh, Kaiser alluded to this uh, concept of principal nations that we indeed elaborated together with, together with the uh, American Council on Foreign Relations and uh, Chatham House. Yeah. And that was in 1979, the year of the creation of IFRI. And uh, uh, that was a common report uh, named uh, Sharing International Responsibility. So uh, I, I, I think that if we reread that report, 40 years old, we will probably find the, all the major okay. concepts that could be uh, useful today. Thank you very much. I found you a little bit wasp, nevertheless, because uh, uh, your, your Harvard uh, life. Uh, I, 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 I'm not so sure that everyone would agree with uh, your optimism uh, about uh, uh, the US and NATO, but, but we will perhaps discuss that later if we have time. Now, I...